Um, hi, hello, everybody. Uh, my name's John. As um, Holly said, I'm, I'm actually over in doing this from uh, Queensland in Australia. So um, it's uh, apologies if some of the sort of examples that I use don't quite fit um, your experience, but they're kind of based on my experience as a clinical psychologist working with people with a range of issues, including people with chromosome 18 um, issues. I've done a fair bit of research with um, families with chromosome 18. So what I've tried to do this morning for me, this afternoon for you, is sort of work through what I think is a really simplified list of um, what I think are kind of the, the four most effective behaviour support strategies. And I'll just say a bit about why I think these four are um, the best ones um, and why um, what, what evidence there is for them. So sorry, I'm just trying to get the screen going. Okay, so um, the first, what you can see on this first slide that I've got for you is a bit of, um, I guess, my thoughts on why we do what we do um, anyway. Um, so I think the reason that we manage challenging behaviour in the ways that we manage it um, is fairly uh, is fairly complicated and is based on all sorts of our own experiences, um, things we hear, things we read, things we've done before that we've felt have worked, ways that we've handled incidents that have stood out for us, ways that we've been told um, by other people are really effective. Um, and I guess primarily how we ourselves were um, disciplined, parented, managed, interacted with when we were kids. And I think when you add all of that up, what you get is a really complicated mixture of strategies, beliefs about strategies and beliefs about what works and what doesn't work that we all use in managing behavior. Um, and I'm sure you can see things on my list that, um, or there are things missing from my list that would be on your list that I haven't thought about. Um, and I think, uh, so, so I think I would encourage you, I, I guess as, the take home message from this first slide is I'll, I would encourage everybody to think about why they think what they think about managing behavior and where those ideas come from because I think it tells us something about um, the underlying principles we're using when we're doing behavior support ourselves. You'll see on my list I've got second from the bottom the heat of the moment and I think that's really important to recognize so one of the things that I often will say when I'm doing workshops on um, managing difficult behavior, challenging behavior, positive behavior support, is that it's really difficult to take emotion and, and um, frustration and our own um, feelings when we are um, in a situation with extremely challenging behavior. And sometimes we do act in the heat at the moment, and I think it's really important to kind of acknowledge that and put that in a place to say that it's okay because I think it's almost impossible not to do it, especially as parents and carers. I think we sometimes have slightly different expectations when there's a professional person involved. If, 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 uh, if uh, our son or daughter is with a paid carer, then there are different expectations about um, how people manage behavior. But I think, we should all acknowledge that um, our feelings do become part of this. I should also say that um, I don't want people to think that um, whether, whether, I, whether I am or am not uh, an expert in behaviour support um, in my office <laughs> at my desk, that can get, get very different when I get home in front of my kids. And I think that's the other thing to, for us all to acknowledge really, that life is different when we are talking about it, workshopping and thinking it, but when we're actually trying to do it, we all slip into things that don't work. We all slip into bad habits. And, and, and this isn't about getting everything perfect. This is about trying to remind ourselves of the things that work. And, and I will routinely do this. I'll go home, I will have, you know, have a, an incident with my kids that I'll try and, try and manage, not do a great job, 
and afterwards think, you know, why didn't I, why didn't I do those things that I know work? But we'll perhaps come back to that when we go through some questions. The four skills that I'm going to talk about, the four principles I'm going to talk about today, are really based very firmly in positive behaviour support. Many of you would have come across positive behaviour support. Some of you would have had quite extensive training in it, perhaps, or will have um, interacted with professionals who are using positive behaviour support strategies. It's, a, it, it's an interesting field that has kind of become almost unmanageably large in that there are a lot of things being done that uh, people describe as being positive behaviour support that probably aren't. Um, but that isn't to say that actually positive behaviour support done well isn't really effective. And I, I've just tried to put a few kind of thoughts around it on this slide for you. So um, there's really good evidence of positive behaviour support in reducing challenging behaviour in, in children, as there is in adults, actually. But the, the, um, the, the majority of the evidence and where actually PBS started what was with children and continues with children. It's useful because it tackles a very wide range of problems. And it's useful, I think, because it helps to build skills. So it's not just really about managing behavior, it's about understanding behavior and then building alternative skills so that that behavior isn't as needed anymore. And it's quite pragmatic. You know, it recognizes that um, behaviors that um, are sort of in, in a repertoire are there because they tend to be effective. We all have ways of getting our message across. We all have a way of getting things done. And the thing about challenging behavior is it's really pretty good at getting things done. And that's a really important aspect, I think, to how I approach managing challenging behavior with families is that it is a communication. It has a function. And what we know about behavior support and function is that if you can work out the why question, if you can understand why a person is engaging in the behavior, what message it is they're trying to communicate, then um, you double your effectiveness of your intervention. So one of the things I see quite a lot as a clinical psychologist going around talking to people, doing my work, is that often when I'm interacting with families or interacting with services, support services, day centers, accommodation services, is that people can get quite focused on eradicating a behavior rather than um, understanding the behavior and changing it. And you'll see that in, um, you all would have seen this before. I've done it, even though I sit here and say this stuff, I've gone home and done this. You all would have, I'm sure, come across examples where there have been behaviour um, reward charts in the house, on a fridge, somewhere, and the thing that's being rewarded is the absence of the behaviour. But really, that if you think about what I've just said beforehand, that becomes tells you something about the sort of problems that we face in the sector. Because before that, I just said behaviour tends to be a communication. Behaviour has a meaning. And so if we just try and reward a person to not do it, we're not doing anything to understand the why question. And I think that tells you one of the things that sort of goes wrong in positive behavior support. It's become such a sort of large area with such a sort of mixed understanding behind it that there's quite a lot going on in the area that isn't necessarily very scientific. What I'm gonna try and focus on today is just four principles that I think are pretty good. There's only four of them. Most of us can remember four things. Um, that's different to being able to do all four things, I totally get that, but at least it's only a list of four, right? I guess the last thing to say about this is that, is just to sort of put on the table this um, tricky issue of punishment. So I'm gonna have a slide on punishment and sort of where I think it fits in positive behavior support in, in terms of why I think it's a strategy to avoid. But I think it's really important to acknowledge that um, depending on where you sit in the, in the spectrum of your role with, with a child, sometimes punishment is within your, um, it's within your rights as a parent, right? Um, if we are paying a carer in an accommodation service to look after 
our loved one, then typically they're not allowed to use punishment. And, for, and that's for a mix of kind of ethical and scientific reasons. But life is different as a parent. And I just want to sort of um, acknowledge that I understand that we all have a different perspective on the role of punishment in parenting. And what I'm going to present um, on one of my slides is why I, where I think punishment can become problematic. And I'm not really approaching that today from a values perspective. I'm approaching it purely from a sort of data-driven science perspective. And then you can all make your judgment as to where it fits with you in your um, approach to caring and parenting. So strategy one, excuse me. Some of these, the, the, the title of the um, title of the workshop is counterintuitive strategies for counterintuitive strategies. And in some ways that underpins why I've picked these four, which is these aren't just the only four behavior support strategies, but they're four things that I think work well, but also four things that I see misunderstood in, in the sector. So one of the big myths I think that is out there that this slide is trying to address is the general belief that if you're doing something good and enjoyable with somebody who then engages in some challenging behavior, or let, 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 let me rephrase that, if your plan is to do something good, let's say you're gonna go out to the cinema. Um, I'm a bit in pre-COVID language there, but we don't have the cinema yet here in Australia, but let's say we're gonna go out to the cinema and, um, and that's due to happen just after breakfast. And there's an instant over breakfast. Child, my child doesn't like the breakfast, thinks I've um, put too much milk in cereal, burnt the toast, goes against the wall, plate breaks, cereal everywhere, um, big uh, argument. And the temptation, I think, is, is, to, is to think at least, and probably to say, well, now that you've done that, we oh, can't go yeah. And it stinks. Everything stinks. And the reason people might uh, believe that, I think, I don't is several reasons. I don't but I think video. one of them is an underlying belief that if you do something rewarding after you have, um, after an incident of challenging behaviour, that you will um, reinforce that behaviour. And one of the that really gets to the, um, the the myth this slide is trying to expose, which is if you have a plan, and part of that plan involves doing an, uh, an enjoyable activity, if there's a challenging behaviour before it, the enjoyable activity won't, by and large, reinforce that behaviour. And in fact, if you have a plan and then you decide not to do the enjoyable activity, that might become, as a result of behavior, that can become a subsequent trigger. Because now the person not only is involved in the behavior, but isn't getting to do the thing, the enjoyable activity for the day. So I think really what I'm trying to say in this, plan, in this slide is plans are good because they uh, increase routine, they increase predictability, and they give everybody a sort of goal to work towards. They give everybody a framework and a structure. Resist the temptation to change the plan as a result of challenging behavior. Clearly, there'll be times when that does have to happen. Sometimes the issue is just a, a basic risk one. The person is too escalated to go and do what you're gonna do. But if you can, um, stick to the plan. Don't think that you doing an enjoyable activity after an incident challenging behavior will reinforce that behavior. There are probably two caveats to that, I would add. One of the things that you do have to avoid is that the behavior itself doesn't lead to the desired event. So let's say uh, my daughter chucks her breakfast against the wall, plates break, breakfast goes everywhere. Um, and during that kind of behavioural escalation, she's, she's saying, I don't want to go to the cinema. I don't want to go to the cinema. The cinema is rubbish. We went to the cinema last week. What I want to do is um, go shopping. And I say, OK, OK, we'll go shopping. That you have got to be careful with. If the behaviour itself leads to 
the event, the, the, the desired event, then you do run a risk of it being reinforcing. Sometimes people will say, well, surely I need a gap between the behavior and the enjoyable activity we plan to do. Maybe, but if you do, it's a very short gap, right? And there's very little evidence that you need a gap of more than a few, more than a few minutes. So as long as there is a natural few minute gap between the behavior and the planned enjoyable activity, you avoid the risk of reinforcing it. So that's principle one I'm suggesting. Make a good plan that enjo involves enjoyable activities. The plan's good for um, the uh, person you're supporting. It's good for you and um, stick to it as far as you can. Strategy two, and this sort of links a little bit to strategy three. So um, again, I think this, um, for some people, this is a counterintuitive strategy and for some people it isn't. Uh, and I think if you reflect on your own pattern of escalation, when you are getting annoyed about a thing, it's frustrating you, um, you start to ruminate on it. You start focusing on other things that confirm your belief um, that uh, you've got going on in your head and you start to become more angry, more frustrated. You start to get the sense that generally speaking, most of us have a pattern of escalation. Um, that is a curve that looks a bit like this. And, um, and I do meet people from time to time who I do struggle to see this curve. So I do accept that there are a group of people who, um, who uh, can escalate from sort of zero baseline to 100, 95%, 100% sort of anger activation very, very, very quickly. And this kind of intervene early um, approach can make limited sense for some people. But for most of us, we have a, a curve of escalation. And really, um, if you look at the numbers on the way up and the numbers on the way down, um, number one and number two are where really where you've got your best shot of intervening, certainly using words and actions. Um, after that, what we know about people's escalation, the, the, the what happens in the brain as we escalate, we become more aroused, whether that's anxiety or anger. We actually, the parts of our brain that allow us to think um, clearly, to hear properly, to take other people's perspectives, they all shut down one after the other as our brain gets more and more ready for um, aggression, effectively, our ability to um, perceive messages outside of a very narrow focus changes. Um, we get better at processing information quickly, but our band of our bandwidth reduces and the pit, bits of our brain that allow us to sort of be rational and, and, and hear messages from other people and think about other people's perspectives, they go offline and so really what that leaves us with is one option which is as far as you can intervene early um, and i've got some ideas in the next slide about what that intervention could look like and it will take us into our third slide uh, our third strategy as well which is about not ignoring behavior which i think is one of the big counterintuitive strategies um, that i um, struggle to get across to people, I think, sometimes. So look, when we're down here at the bottom of this curve, uh, level one or level two, really that is where we can use some basic behavior support strategies to try and reduce anxiety or anger. So basic strategies like active listening. As I said, if you are going to use something like active listening, make it clear to the person that you've heard what they're saying, and you're changing your actions as a result, you've got to do that early because actually the part of their brain that allows them to engage in active listening is going to go offline by stage four, probably, of that anger curve. So you've got to get in there early with it. Redirection works when you're very low down that curve. Um, and probably what it should say in brackets after that is 
to a um, desirable activity, to a favoured activity. It's much easier to get to, to move somebody's attention onto a different thing if that different thing is something that they really value and is something that they would really like to engage in. Um, stim change. This is a fascinating one for me, and I think sort of um, highlights um, in some ways um, how little we know about parts of the human brain. But if you can change just the, the nature of the stimulation that the person is exposed to, it forces them into a lull. And that lull can be a few minutes, a few seconds, but it can be much longer than that. So by that, I mean change the person that they're talking to. Change the light in the room. If you're inside, go outside. If you're outside, go inside. If it's noisy, make it quiet. If it's quiet, make it noisy. If you really change the level of stimulation a person is subject to, it can it introduces what we call a lull, and that gives you an opportunity. It's a sort of honeymoon period. Can just be a few seconds or minutes, but that can be all you need to then do some redirection or some active listening. Use of humour, that can work can massively backfire. You sort of have to use your judgment as to your relationship with that person. And last one on that list, I've got, um, <laughs> I've written it a strategic capitulation. What that really means is back out, get out of the way, move, move away from the situation. If, if your presence is the trigger, um, and sometimes that can be hard for us to sort of acknowledge, but if we are the trigger, then one of the reason, one of the best ways of managing that is to remove the trigger. Strategy three, don't ignore all disruptive behavior. And really what I'm trying to get at in this slide is this old adage that we hear, and I've, I'm embarrassed to say that I, I would within the last, I'm trying harder with this at home, but we would, would within the last two years have um, gone to a workshop, told people what a bad idea this is, gone home and done it. Um, is to avoid that temptation to see behavior as attention seeking and therefore to ignore it. Just ignore it. Think about how it feels to be ignored as a, as a first step. For most of us, we don't like to be ignored. And what tends to happen if we're ignored is we turn the volume up on our behavior, right? You go home, your partner doesn't quite realize how annoyed you are. Suddenly you're walking upstairs a bit more loudly than usual. That doesn't seem to get, in a, get any attention. Maybe that door gets shut a bit more loudly than it normally would, and so on. Up goes your behavior. If you ignore behavior, then ten, what tends to happen is it will escalate. This idea that behavior is as a result of wanting attention, that's not problematic. Often it is. Behavior is a communication about wanting attention. What's very interesting is that we've somehow developed this approach to that, which is, to not give somebody attention when they want it. And I think that probably links to slide one around concerns about what's being reinforced and what isn't. But as a general rule, don't ignore behavior. It will only escalate. And for a large group of people, their behavior is about wanting attention. That's the function of it. And what I've tried to do to stick to the theme of four is to say, well, look, it is really important to try and work out why someone is doing it, but here's a list of four very common reasons. To get something, to avoid something, um, in response to a sensory need or in response to pain. Those four reasons tend to be, account for a very large portion of the reasons why people, children and adults, in fact, engage in challenging behavior. Um, and probably the most common, in fact, statistically or data wise, the most common is um, to get a certain thing. And then the next most common is to get social reward, so attention. And then the next most common is to avoid something. Um, but that will vary between people. And it's about you understanding the sort of common behavioral patterns of the people that you are, are in your family and that you work with. So that's strategy three. Don't ignore disruptive behavior. Um, it will probably just make it escalate. Last strategy. Um, and this kind of links to my comments at the beginning of the um, presentation about punishment. 
generally speaking, um, what we know is that punishment, um, if we take the long view, punishment tends not to change behavior. So if we start from there, as a general behavior change strategy, whatever behavior it is you're trying to change, it's not a great strategy. What it can sometimes do is stop behaviors in the very short term. And that is probably how we as parents, caregivers, people, citizens get reinforced for it, right? We use a punishment, it stops a behavior, and it stops it in the short term. So our, our behavior of punishing somebody is reinforced because it works, but it works in the short term. And there are some issues with it. And most of us will kind of get this intuitively. Um, what will happen over time is that behavior comes back. And that's why we tend to engage in the same punishments with the same people over time. And it will come back at the same rate. It will also not generalize. So if you punish somebody for doing something in a certain situation at a certain time, they will kind of form a belief about not doing that thing in that area at that time, rather than generalizing it. But I think, so, so there are some really good scientific reasons as to, um, as, as to why punishment is a thing to avoid. I think the other thing it introduces into a dynamic is when you're trying to manage behavior, really what you're trying to do is de-escalate a situation. It's about, it's about that principle too, around the anger curve. And punishment is usually a trigger in itself. So somebody is engaging in some challenging behavior, your use of a punishment to manage that behavior just makes the behavior escalate even further. And so as a strategy to give, bring someone back down the other side of that curve, it tends to be unsuccessful. What you're trying to get to really is a point where people are calm. In that, in that strategy three slide where I talked about the stim, stimulus change, introducing a lull, that's really what you're trying to aim at more generally. It's only when people are calm that you can do that behavioral teaching. You can introduce new strategies. You can teach somebody a new way of managing things. Nobody, none of us can learn when we're really wound up and we're really escalated. And really, this is what I mean by play the long game. A behavioral escalation, an event itself, is not the time to be trying to introduce new material, to, to make a point, to teach a lesson. You can only do that when everybody has calmed down and... That sort of makes behavior support a long game, not a short game. All right, that I think, uh, Holly, is 30 minutes on the dot. And so I am more than happy to take some questions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'll go ahead and kind of go through the questions that were in the chat box. And then if we still have a little bit of time, um, I'll open it up if anyone else has a question. But thank you again for all of that information. The first question that came up uh, was from Bonnie. She said, hi, from Western Australia, 18Q married Martin, um, also with 18Q. How's the COVID situation over there? Oh, um, well, here's my mask. I'm not allowed to leave my office without my mask. Um, but otherwise, things are not too bad. So um, I consider myself lucky. Got it. All right. And then from Liz, she says, uh, is threatening to remove something they like punishment? Or are you referring more to capital or physical punishment or even timeouts sitting alone in a chair punishment? Really great question. So look, it is technically punishment. And this is where, again, I want to be really, care really kind of straightforward and careful here to say, I'm not um, trying to advance uh, a, a sort of methodology for all parenting by saying you may, you should not remove favored items um, from somebody as a way of managing behavior. But if your question is, is that punishment? Then yeah, it is. Punishment is split into two. Unfortunately, sometimes, so like we have positive and negative reinforcement, in positive reinforcement, you're adding in a thing to increase a behavior. In negative reinforcement, you're taking something away to increase a behavior. When you're using the word punishment, you are talking about reducing a behavior. 
in what used to be called positive punishment, bad word, now we call it type one punishment, you are adding something in to decrease a behavior, a smack to reduce a behavior. In type two punishment, negative punishment, you're taking something away to decrease a behavior. Take away the iPad to decrease acting, some, some kind of behavior. So it is punishment. Um, and you use your own judgment, I suppose, as to where that fits within the other points I've made about the how it can in and of itself act as a trigger. Have I done it? Yeah, I've done it. Honestly, hand on my heart, do I think it made it better? No, I think it does act as a trigger. Punishment is just one of those traps we fall into that um, it's really they're really hard to get out of. Got it. Thank you for breaking that down a little bit more. Uh, would you mind um, stop sharing your screen so we can see you a little bit bigger? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure why you would want that, but. Um, we had a request. And then if you just click the little monitor at the bottom, let's see if that will have you stop sharing. Oh, that's probably taken me oh, away. The camera. <laughs> there we go. Uh, full screen, maybe. How's that? It should be the, um, do you see the four buttons at the bottom? There's the, the camera, the microphone, the TV or monitor looking screen, and then the settings. Oh, yeah. If you'll click that second one from the right, the monitor looking one. There awesome. we go. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We have a few more questions. Um, so from Natalia, she said, uh, punishment is okay for adult children from their parents. Like, like question. <laughs> yeah, punishment is okay. Punishment in a family context is okay. I think what I'm what I'm sort of putting out there is some reasons why it might not be the best way of managing behaviour. If if you're just trying to look at the cold hard facts of what things increase behaviour and what things reduce behaviour, then what we know is positive strategies are much better whether that's positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement, are much better at reducing behavior than punishment-based strategies. The barb is there is a general expectation socially that we use punishment. We as adults are subject to punishment. If I drive too fast on the way to work, I get stopped by a policeman, I get done by a speed camera, I get punished. That's a punishment schedule. I get given a speeding fine. That's designed to reduce my behavior by using punishment doesn't work right we all know that so it's not really a moral question that I'm um, trying to um, thank thank God uh, address here it's more of a sort of trying to sort of make it science-based it does become an ethics question when you are in a human services context so if, if there's a paid carer an accommodation service you're paying somebody to provide support then i think the landscape changes a bit and using punishment tends not to be acceptable for accreditation and um legal let you know legislative reasons um it tends to be outlawed um, but as parents we exist in a different setting awesome thank you and natalia said i believe adults punishing adult children is unacceptable. I am against punishment at any age. Thank you for articulating. articulating. Excuse me. All right, our next question comes from Camilla. She said, my daughter is 19 years old. One difficult behavior is not respecting my personal space and boundaries. Messing with my hair or my head every time she comes near me. When I continue to ask her to respect my space and to please stop, she will get angry and say I'm ruining her fun. Then have a 30 minute to an hour meltdown about it. Can I use these strategies for that? Yeah, yeah. So I think it comes back to that question about function, which is a behavior like that. that those are really interesting behaviors. So if, <coughs> excuse me, you remember my list of the four most common functions of behavior. Um, to get a thing or to get attention, um, to, to get away from a thing, sensory kind of stimulation or due to pain. Often those kinds of behaviours you're describing can be, um, can be about attention and physical contact, but can be a sensory component. So I think it's about trying to understand the why. Why is the person doing this? What is the actual 
um, behavior itself about what need is it meeting and then can I find another way of, of the person getting that need met that doesn't involve the thing that is difficult in that case the, the the touching the hair the personal space type issue I had a client recently who would grab my hand like that really squeeze and it hurt but what would actually happen was then I would grab his hand to try and get his hand off of my hand and that was the thing that was reinforcing for him. He liked the deep pressure. When I would grab his hand and, and, and squeeze, he got a real sense of, uh, got the deep pressure through his hand and it was calming for him. And so there was a real sensory component to the behavior. It was nothing about physical aggression, but initially it felt really aggressive to me. Um, so yeah, focus on function is all I can suggest. Got it, thank you. And Camilla said, I've tried to direct her to putting pressure on something else other than me but she won't go for that. Yeah, one so look, one of the things I, um, and this is where people get frustrated, right? Because um, it's, it's easy for me to kind of sit here in my office and say, well, it could be this, it could be this, but it's very, you've all got deep experience of the situation that you're in. One of the things that has reminded me of though, is that I mentioned earlier on in the presentation, challenging behaviors tend to be reinforced for us as individuals by the fact of how effective they are. So we do things, the more effective they are, the more likely we are to do them. Same thing happens with challenging behavior. A person that engages in a behavior to get a need met does so because it tends to get that need met really well. So one of the things you have to do is work out what need it is they're getting met, what the function is. But usually when you find what we call a replacement behavior, that behavior is never quite as effective as the original challenging behavior. Otherwise, they, they probably would have picked that one instead. It's never quite as impactful. It's never quite as good at getting their needs met. So what you have to do is reinforce the hell out of it. You have to bribe someone effectively to use the new behavior because it's just not as good and as practical and good at getting their needs met as the original one. And so what we tend to, what I tend to do with families is the same, right, we work out the function of the behavior, we find a replacement behavior, we train the person how to do that thing, and then we reinforce the hell out of it. Got it. Thank you for really breaking that down. Um, our next question is from Natalia. She said, for sensory seekers, they often violate for their own needs, like hugging, even those who do not like it. Do you have effective strategies for impulse control? Yeah, uh, well, I say yeah, no. <laughs> um, you, you're absolutely right. It, it's purely um, about um, getting a need met. You, you've identified the function. It's about getting a sensory need met. And often it is hard to find a practical or pragmatic way of that sensory need being met elsewhere. So the best way of getting deep pressure is a hug, right? Um, and, and it sort of probably meets some other sensory needs as well. When you hug a person who's familiar, they've got a smell, you like the touch of their clothes, and you get the deep pressure. So it's meeting multiple sensory issues. Um, I had a client who who used to hug a lot and would, would um, go and hug strangers, and, and that was a highly problematic behavior that got him in trouble with the criminal justice system. And the only thing I found that could, uh, that helped, was we got him one of those um, diving vests, a buoyancy aid, and you pump them up, and it would just squeeze his torso tighter and tighter and tighter. And it did the same job as a hug. And so we would sort of do that before we went out or we'd do it when we got back and we would sort of gradually increase the time that he could go between the use of this um, thing that we would bought him. And, and over time it did work. Um, I, it, it, the, the, the meeting the sensory function is probably where I found having to be most creative. And I, I completely understand um, the challenges that you've got. It's, it's really difficult. Thank you, and thank you for, for, for providing that example. Uh, we still have a few more questions. Um, we really appreciate your time. Um, we have a question from Liz. She said, ignore the behavior, not the child, is a saying I dislike a lot. Is that what strategy three is speaking to? Ignore, no, not, 
Um, not necessarily, because I think if we ignore the behavior, we run the risk of the behavior escalating. Because what I'm suggesting is that behavior tends to have a function. It's a communication about a, about a need. So if we ignore it, then um, we run the risk of them turning the volume up on that behavior because we're not, the function isn't being met. Sometimes what you might be putting your finger on there is that common, one of the common um, functions of behavior, challenging behavior in a child is to get attention. And so if you ignore the behavior, but not the child, then actually you are meeting the function by engaging with the child. You're putting the behavior to one side, you're engaging with the child, and so guess what? You're meeting the function, and that is okay. But let's say the function of the behavior is escape and avoidance. They're trying to, it's, this is the classic in a classroom setting, right? That schools really struggle to manage with, with using good behavioral technology. The child who can't understand the lesson starts to act out in the classroom because they are frustrated, they can't understand the material, and, and, and guess what the teacher does? Sends them out of the classroom. But actually, the function of that behavior is exactly that. I don't understand the lesson, so what I want is to escape this. Teacher kicks child out of room, you've just reinforced the, the function of that behavior. That would be an example of where you wouldn't want to ignore the behavior or the child. Got it, thank you so much. All right, we got a question from Janine. She said, any strategies for getting to the why, particularly for toddlers with limited communication? Yeah, <laughs> great question, thank you. Um, you sort of need nerdy, dispassionate scientific adv advisors hanging around your house to, to kind of do this in a way that it's really hard to see it when you're in it, right? It's one of the reasons why it is useful to engage some, whether it's a health professional, a psychologist, or somebody to help you do some observation, get some data. What I try and say to people is get data, make it data driven. That's where you see the patterns. And sometimes you just can't see it when you're in it. And so really when I'm when I'm talking, when I'm doing workshops with people about your exact question, it's all well and good saying, you've got to find out the function of the behavior. But I'll, I'll, I've run sort of eight half day workshops on just the working out what the function bit is. So it isn't easy. You're absolutely right. What I tend to do is try and say, you know, it, if you can collect data, if you can get somebody to come in to do an observation, they will see patterns that you just can't see. Um, often because you're, you're just part of the dynamic that's in there. And you need a sort of external pair of eyes on it. Um, but yeah, it's it's not straightforward. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that was a great question, Janine. <laughs> All right. Um, we just have time for maybe one more question. If we don't get to your questions, um, one of our staff will get with Dr. Mason and we'll try to get a few more out to you guys. Um, here's our last question. It's uh, from Christine. She said, what if you cannot figure out why a behavior is occurring. I have been advised a lot advised a lot to ignore behavior and not give any reinforcement to the behavior. Oh, look, I don't want to get into criticizing what other professionals have said to you, but I think, uh, I just think that, you, I just think it's risky ignoring behavior. I think it's, they're almost two separate things. What if you can't work out why it's happening is a little bit different to therefore just ignore it. I don't think those two fit together very well. Um, can't work out why it's happening. Yeah, that that is, it, it's people are really complicated. Social systems are really complicated. Working out why behavior is happening is really hard. But that doesn't necessarily equal to me. Therefore, just ignore it. What it says to me is somehow finding the energy to keep trying new things, to try and work out, to almost take a sort of um, reverse engineered approach. Okay, I can't work out what it is inductively by looking at the data, getting data, looking at it and seeing the pattern. So what I'll do is try and reverse engineer it and just keep trying things until I can see a pattern in what works that I'm doing. And maybe I can then work out why it's happening and what the function is. 
I think I just, uh, I feel nervous about ignoring something. I feel nervous about suggesting to somebody to ignore a behavior that is a legitimate request for attention from a child, if that were the case, you know? How we've got here as a society where we think it, that a request for attention should be ignored is a bit of a mystery to me. It sounds really cold when you say it, just, you know, if someone wants attention, ignore them. I, would, I, would, I hope, I hope that we can do better than that as a society, but um, I will also go home and probably say to my partner sometime over the next three months, I'll oh, just ignore her. <laughs> I think you're on mute there, Holly. There we go. Oh, she's still on mute. Thank you so much. Dr. Mason, this has been fabulous. <laughs> you are you are more than welcome. Um, so I will I will drop out of the meeting. Um, but look, it's been great to meet you. Thanks for your questions. Thank you. Um, there was a there was a question earlier on about um, time out, which I will also put in an answer um, to Holly as well. You know, Dr. Mason, I didn't get to end, but I, we have horses and we train horses. And one of the big trainings that we say with horses, and sometimes I equate small children to my horses. Yeah. I feel like they're almost interchangeable sometimes. So, there's no animal more tuned in to the human condition other than a toddler than a, to a horse. Well, and one of the things we should say is that punishment teaches nothing. It lets yeah. an animal know what you don't like, but it teaches nothing. And that only positive reinforcement teaches. So. Yeah. That's our mainstream of training. Good on you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>